at high school GI this year, uh, from a practice standpoint, um, um, if I could uh, use the theme of, again, precision medicine and circling tumor DNA-based testing or NGS testing, uh, the key takeaways that would reinforce my practice or um, change my practice, uh, if I could go down the different malignancies, um, I would say, for, firstly, for cholangiocarcinoma, uh, we cannot emphasize the fact that it's such a target-rich disease, and we saw updates on two target therapies, uh, NFGFR inhibitor as well as IDH inhibitor. Uh, uh, so that is something that's already, uh, for one, there's approval. The other one, uh, there's an endorsement in the season guidelines who uh, we have been using for it for some of our patients. And now with multiple of the FGFR inhibitors showing value, uh, it's a good problem to kind of figure out sequencing and how would we choose between the different FGFR inhibitors. Um, uh, for pancreas cancer, um, while uh, we saw the uh, pre opine study in terms of um, uh, lack of benefit of uh, radiation therapy, and we still have to learn from a target therapies perspective. While there's a lot of debate and controversy regarding um, the polo study with the laparib as maintenance, uh, I would say, uh, at least from my practice standpoint, it is an option for our patients. Uh, I see many patients for second opinion, and all of these are young onset pancreas cancer who've been on fulfernox for months and months in terms of uh, numerable uh, um, cycles of therapy. And it's underestimated the amount of toxicity that they get. It's not just the cumulative neuropathy from oxaliplatin. There's also cumulative liver damage from state hepatitis, venoclusive disease, uh, cytopenias. And now down the line, you know, they're jeopardized from even getting other therapies or trial options. So uh, a power inhibitor in these situation is a meaningful uh, uh, strategy and a, a valuable option to have. Uh, bear in mind, in, in real world, uh, you know, there's no placebo or breaks. So there's a lot of apprehension, both from the physician as well as the patient, to come off of uh, uh, um, uh, systemic chemotherapy for as aggressive as a disease as uh, pancreas cancer, which is very unforgiving. So in that scenario, that's where uh, the value of uh, choosing a target therapy, which uh, has uh, improved quality of life. A lot of these patients have uh, durable uh, long-term outcomes, uh, as well as it's a pill. Uh, you don't have to come for infusions every two weeks, which is even more pertinent in uh, current times with COVID and avoiding ex unnecessary exposure and um, keeps options open for a lot of these patients. Um, I think there's still to learn, but I would say it's still an option for our patients. And then uh, for upper GI cancers, uh, there's so much going on from an immunotherapy perspective. Uh, it's uh, reassuring to see that in the NCCN guidelines, uh, both the uh, frontline addition of Pembro for the ones who have CPS and more than five, as well as the adjuvant uh, nivolumab for the ones who have residual disease post uh, the uh, chemo radiation for esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, is something that's uh, practice changing. Uh, and then um, uh, it was could not have been more perfect timing for TDXD, uh, the trastuzumab breast to kind of get an approval by the FDA. It's approved in Japan already, and um, uh, the approval in USA came in a timely fashion the same day when ASCO GI started. Uh, I think it's great to have that as an additional option for all of our patients who are uh, HER2 positive, and the, the, the activity in the data is going beyond um, uh, just breast cancer uh, now for GI, and it's being explored other malignancies too, so uh, that's wonderful to have that as an option. And then uh, finally, a, um, a different type of liquid biopsy, which is the, the minimal residual disease bucket of liquid biopsies or circular tumor DNA-based testing platforms. Uh, we saw more data uh, on uh, the, the strong uh, uh, prognostic and maybe even predictive value of uh, some of these uh, uh, platforms, some of which are tumor-informed, some of which are tumor agnostic. Um, again, um, we still have to learn a lot, and uh, it's important to kind of enroll in the ongoing trials. Uh, there's the bespoke study for stage 2-3 colorectal cancer, and there's the NRG study, COBRA, which is for stage 2A. Uh, we'll know more on the predictive power of this, uh, but uh, there is definitely um, a niche in a void where it's providing a value. So, for example, in a lot of stage 2 patients where you weren't necessarily considering chemotherapy, if the CTDNA MRDSA comes back as positive, 100% uh, of these patients recur. So, uh, it will be practice changing. It is practice changing where uh, a lot of the experts would agree that that's a situation where you may want to consider some sort of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy if you weren't planning on. The surveillance as a tool um, uh, is interesting where 
depending on different studies, regardless of the marker you look at, it's a lead time of at least uh, eight to 12 months, depending on the study done. Again, we'll learn more from some of these trials, but um, uh, some of these tools are already uh, Medicare endorsed and um, uh, the turnaround is less than four weeks for the initial assay and then uh, pretty much the results come back in uh, one week as one of my mentors and colleagues put it, it's like a supercharged CA biomarker. Uh, a better tool. Uh, I think and I see its place. Uh, we still have uh, to, again, enroll in the ongoing trials. Cannot uh, overemphasize that. But um, at the same time, there are situations, uh, even now, in terms of practice, where uh, it, it could be considered.